34. Hymn number 634, My Country Tis of Thee. Oh, man. 
offertory hymn is going to be hymn 633, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Would you please rise? Amen. All right. 
Well, I'm glad that y'all are here again. I pray the Lord that we've been having to that we've been able to have the opportunity to assemble together today to lift up his holy name, to thank him for his blessings, to thank him for our nation, to praise him for this great country, and also to, to thank him for Jesus Christ, our great Savior, the great one that changed all things and made all things possible, and we just worship him uh, this morning. And this morning, there's only two verses I want to read for you. And that's Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, Psalm chapter 33, verse 12. And like I said, the, name, the uh, title of the message this morning is The Nation Exalted. Before we get into the word, I want to read something to you that, um, that I found. And uh, I was looking, of course, you all know I like history and like looking at things about uh, uh, especially American history. And I was looking at articles about the Declaration of Independence. And um, I came across this, this article that um, I wanted to, to read to you this morning. An article that truly shows a little bit about the Declaration that maybe you might not have known. And, and the meaning. What exactly does it say? We could sit there and we could read the Declaration of Independence. And, 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 of course, a lot of its words are, are common, we know. But what exactly does it mean? What did our forefathers try to do for our nation with the Declaration of Independence? The Declaration of Independence was designed for multiple audiences, for the King of England, for the colonists, and for the world. It was also designed to multitask its goals, um, um, I'm sorry, to multitask. Its goals were to rally the troops, win foreign allies, and to announce the creation of a new country. This introductory sentence states the declarations, I'm sorry, the introductory statement, sentence states the declaration's main purpose, to explain the colonists' right to revolution, in other words, to declare the causes which impelled them to the separation. Congress had to prove the legitimacy of its cause. It had just defied the most powerful nation on earth, and it needed to motivate foreign allies to join in that fight. As far as the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, these are the lines contemporary Americans know best. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These stirring words were designed to convince Americans to put their lives on the line for the cause. Separation from the mother country threatened their sense of security, economic stability, and identity. The preamble sought to inspire and unite the nation through the vision of a better life. The most important and dramatic statement comes near the end of the Declaration of Independence, quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. It declares a complete break with Britain and its king and claims the powers of an independent country. Now, when we look at the Declaration of Independence, that's exactly what it is. It is a declaration. There's no legal binding words. There's nothing in it that we could say is law. There's nothing in the Declaration of Independence to say we have to do this or we have to do that. The Declaration of Independence is the declaration of this nation that we would be free from England, that we declare our freedom, that we declare our ability to be our own, that we declare that we will have independent states and that we declare our faith and our belief in God the Father. Our nation was founded on religious freedom. Our nation was founded on people, or founded by people who came here wanting to escape the, or the religious persecution of other nations and to have the freedom to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. The freedom to call him to be our own. 
When the Declaration of Independence was given, signed July 4th, 1776, it was done in a way that God be first. A while ago I read to you about that every person is equal under their creator. That was a capital C in creator. It is God. Our nation was founded on God. Our nation was founded on Jesus Christ. The main textbook in schools was the Bible. People prayed. Our Congress prayed. Our president prayed. Through the last 244 years, I believe, we've kind of gotten away from a lot of that. We've kind of gotten away from God being first. We've gotten away from lifting his name above all others. We've gotten away from the importance of teaching the Bible. We've gotten away from the importance of prayer. We've gotten away from the importance of all things of God. We have come to a time in the culture of not only our nation, but to a time in the culture of the world where the Bible describes it as people with itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to get by with what they want to get by with, and they don't want to be held accountable to anybody. That is not a nation that is exalted. That is a nation in rebellion. That is a world in rebellion. And God came and sent Jesus Christ that all men would be saved. Because let me tell you something right now from the pulpit. In the eyes of Jesus Christ, all lives matter. Amen. It doesn't matter your heritage. It doesn't matter your origin. It doesn't matter your genetics. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. If you are of the age to understand what sin is, God wants you to be saved. Because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves everyone. Peter tells us. That it is God's desire that no one should perish. Amen. It is time for our nation to be exalted again. It is time for our nation to seek out the Lord Jesus Christ again. It is time for our nation to pray again. It is time for our nation to teach the Bible again. It's time to return to the roots of this great nation and the roots of this great nation is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this morning I want to read these two verses to you. You don't have to, if you don't want to turn, that's fine. It's only two verses. But I want to read these verses to you. And then I want to share three things with you that I get out of these verses. But as always, in reverence of the reading of the word of God, I will ask you to stand with me. As I read for you Proverbs chapter 14 verse 34 and then Psalm chapter 33 verse 12. In Proverbs, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Psalm 33, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people he chose for his inheritance. Let's pray together. Father, these words cannot sum up a more powerful meaning, a more simpler meaning than they give to us today. Father, as a nation, as the great United States of America, God, we want to claim these. Father, on behalf of our people, on behalf of President Trump, on behalf of Vice President Pence, on behalf of every member of Congress, every member of the judicial system, every member of our military, all the way down to the local mayors and county and parish leaders, Father, I want to voice I want to voice a call to return to you on behalf of this great nation. Father, we need righteousness again. 
We need sin put aside. We need the blessed presence of yourself and the Lord Jesus Christ in our nation once again in the forefront. We know, Father, that you are with us. We know, Father, that you have never left us. You have never forsaken us. But, Father, as a whole, this nation does not have you in the forefront as it once did. You have chosen us, Father, to be the great United States of America. You have chosen, Father, that we should be a beacon of light to this world. You have chosen, Father, that this nation in its formation should be a rallying point for morality. And, Father, you have also chosen for our nation to be defenders and protectors of the nation of Israel. And I believe that with all my heart. Father, I pray for that great revival to take place in our nation. I pray, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ to be called, to be summoned back into our hearts once again. I pray, Father, that this nation, beginning in the White House and working its way all the way through every house in this nation, Father God, that families will be lifted up, that, 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 that hearts will will be reunited with you or united with you for the first time. I pray, Father, as Brennan read to us a while ago, that we as Christians will turn from our wicked ways and we shall call out to you, Jesus, to be the leader and great triumphant of this nation. Oh, Father, I think about on Palm Sunday when Jesus made his triumphant entry back into Jerusalem. He had been to Jerusalem before, but this time it was different. God, how we need a triumphant entry of Jesus Christ in the United States today. Father, how we as a nation need to lay our palm branches down. Father God, how we need to cry out hallelujah. How we need to cry out blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How much we should cry out Blessed is the Son of David. Father, we ask for that triumphant return. We ask, Father, for a great revival. We ask, Father, that we will once again become a nation exalted and all the glory shall be yours, Father. And it's in Jesus' most wonderful and perfect and holy and sovereign name that I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In these two verses are some of the most powerful words dealing with the nation. Before I go any further into the message, I want to draw your attention back to Proverbs 14, verse 34. And I just want to highlight the last part of that verse. But sin is a disgrace to any people. It doesn't matter if you're American, if you're British, if you're Russian, or Chinese, or Japanese, or any nation on this world. Sin is sin. Sin is a direct rebellion against God. Sin is what God hates. A nation may be exalted because of righteousness, but the Bible tells us that sin affects everyone. And it doesn't matter how great and powerful you are or how meek and lowly you are. Sin is supposed to be a disgrace to everyone. In other words, what this verse is telling us is, if you love your nation, then you should pray for sin to be gone. If you want your nation to be right with God, then you should be disgusted by sin. Ask God for forgiveness. Ask for his forgiveness to cover your nation and to ded dedicate your nation back to him once again. Now taking these two verses into consideration, there are three things that I want to share with you this morning that, will be, that you can draw out of both of these verses. The first one is this. The nation exalted is a nation that worships God. First and foremost, 
if we are going to be a nation that is exalted, if we are going to be a nation that is lifted up, then we have to worship God. We have to put God first. Proverbs 14.34, righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness, living righteously. In other words, living by just and godly principles. As great and as wonderful as the Declaration of Independence is, it is nothing compared to the Word of God. As guiding a light as our Constitution and Bill of Rights and the amendments and other great legal and binding documents of our nation are and can be, they are nothing compared to the Word of God. It is the Holy Bible that should be the document that guides not only the United States, but all nations. It is the one document that every person, no matter the age, no matter the nationality, no matter the uh, uh, genetic descent, it should be the one thing that every person adheres to. It was not written to the Americans. It was not written just for the Russians. It was not written, the New Testament, just for the Jews. It was written to a people, a people of righteous, God, uh, uh, living, godly, principled people. Those that are called Christians. And Christians transcend being American, or being Japanese, or being Chinese, or being Indian, or whatever the nation, whatever the continent, whatever the people may be. Christians are the children of God. Preaching, and we are of all nations and of all people. And if we want our nation of origin to be a nation that is exalted, then we should live by the godly principles outlined in the Word of God. And if we as the bride of Christ want the church as a whole, the church universal, to be exalted and lifted up above the ways of this world, then Christians need to live godly. Need to hold to the godly principles of the word of God. We need to live, each and every one of us, who believe in the word of God, who believe in Jesus Christ and Savior, we need each one to live as the Bible says we are to live. And by doing that, the church grows stronger. By doing that, Louisiana grows stronger. By doing that, the United States grows stronger. By doing that, worldwide revival could happen and people of all nations and of all descents will return to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are going to be a nation exalted, my fellow Americans, then we have to worship the one true God. We need to worship Jesus Christ. Every other God in this world is man-made. Every other God in this world is a figment of Satan's imagination. Every other God in this world, every other person that has ever been esteemed, is either dying or dead in the grave. But our Lord Jesus Christ lives forever. And our Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And He, and He alone, is the one that the United States should worship. Amen. If we are going to be a nation exalted, then we need to be a nation that worships the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two. The nation exalted is a nation that is honored. The nation exalted is a nation that is honored. At one point in time in history, every world, every nation in the world looked at the United States and envied us. Every nation in the world looked at us and was in awe because we were truly the greatest nation. Today, most countries that have Christian missionaries, 
They send them to the United States. We have become one of the top receiver of missionaries of nations in the world. Because we are no longer, we're still great. We're no longer where we were. We are no longer completely honored and revered as a nation. In some places, I hate to say this, but it is my duty to speak the truth. We have become a laughing stock to other nations. And that is terrible. That is absolutely terrible. And do you know why we are like that? Because we have skipped number one. We don't worship Jesus anymore as a nation. And if we are not looking to Jesus first, and I bring you back to Peter, when Peter stepped out of the boat in the middle of that storm and he walked on the water, he did so as long as his eyes were continually fixed upon Jesus Christ. And his faith was in him and him alone. But once Peter took his eyes off and began to look elsewhere other than Jesus, he began to sink. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, our nation has sunk because we have taken our eyes off of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we are not focused on Him and Him alone, we cannot worship Him. And if we are not worshiping Him, we cannot be a nation that is honored. Preach it, brother. Preach it. To be a nation that honors, that is honored, it bring you back to Proverbs 14, a righteous Righteousness exalts a nation. The Bible says that if we live with godly principles, then we shall be exalted. That's what that verse is saying in the first part. But what does it mean to be exalted? It means to be raised up with honor. It means to be lifted up, to be esteemed, to be placed on a podium above all other things. When righteousness is present, a people are honored. When righteous is when, when righteous then honored. And our nation is not honored like it once was because we are not righteous like we once were. Unfortunately, we have many, many in our nation who have slipped into the state of self-righteous. And that's a terrible thing. Even when you put yourself before Jesus Christ, you have an idol in your life. When you put your family before Jesus Christ, you have an idol in your life. When you put your church before Jesus Christ, you have an idol in your life. And you are not worshiping God, so you are not exalted. You are not being honored. The true men and women, the true heroes of the Bible were the ones that always put Jesus first. The true ones that we still talk about today and share uh, their records out of the scripture, they worship Jesus Christ. And anytime we go through and we see uh, any of them that took their eyes off of Christ, what happened? They sinned and they fell. Solomon, David, Samson, Peter, like I said, Every one of them, when they took their eyes off of Christ, they fell. But the great thing about our God and our Savior is that when we get to the point that we realize that we have messed up, we can say, Father, forgive us. Lord, restore us. And you know what he does? Because he loves us so much. He loves us so much. For this nation to be exalted once again, we have to return to the state of worshiping Jesus Christ and return to his word. And once we do that, then we will be a nation that will be honored once again among, not only among other nations, but in the eyes of God. He will truly honor us once again. And the third thing that I want you to know this morning is this. A nation exalted is a nation content. Now that's probably a big one right there. Especially as Americans, we are not content. 
You look out there, and, and you know, one of the big things for Michelle and I, when we're watching TV, and they got the commercial for this iPhone, or this tablet, or this computer, and Michelle said, well, wait, number three just came out yesterday, and they've already got number 11 and a half, or something like that. We're not content. We want more. We want more. We want more. We want what's better. We want what's bigger. We want what's faster. And in most cases, whatever can make us lazier. We bought this, y'all, I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we, we got this pool in the backyard for the kids now. We went and we got the test strips to check the water, check the pH balance and the alkalinity and all that stuff. And I scooped it down in there and brought the strip up. And I looked at Michelle and said, what do we do next? And Michelle looked in the, at the instructions and she said, you download the app to get the results. Like, we can't just look at it and go, and then I got to take a picture of it, and then they look on your phone and it tells you what you need. We've become so lazy as a nation because we're not content anymore. The nation that is exalted is content. In other words, it's happy. The nation that is exalted is content. In other words, the condition of that nation is desirable to all. A nation that is exalted is a nation that is content. In other words, the individual is happy. If we can become content again, we can be such a great nation again. If we can be happy with what we have, we can become such a great nation again. If we could learn as a nation to put aside greed, to put aside that, that, that looking at what the neighbor has and wishing that we had better, we can become a better nation. If we could just learn to trust in the word of God for our daily bread once again, we would become a better nation. And as we become a better nation dependent upon God and content with the word of God, then other nations will see us as more desirable. The, the, the reason that so many people flocked to the United States at one time was because we were the place of religious freedom. We were the place to learn about God. We were the place where the Bible was taught. We were the place where Jesus Christ was freely and openly proclaimed everywhere. But we're not content with God anymore. We're content to find ways to work around God to find happiness. We're content to find ways to work around God so that we can solve our own problems. We are content to, to work around God and find all the self-helps and to find everything but him. You know. And we're wrong for doing that. Our nation is not content. Our nation is not exalted because we don't worship God. We don't read his word. We are not being esteemed and lifted up by him. And if we're not being esteemed and lifted up by God, then we're really not that content. We're not that desirable to other nations. I want you to think about these things. Why? Why should we return to a state of righteousness? Why should we return to a state of godly principles? Why should we return to a state of the Bible being first and foremost? Why should we return to a place where we can be content with God as a nation? Well, I want to give you these reasons. First of all, God is real. God is true. God is not man-made. He is the only true. He is the only original in the entire universe. He is the only thing, believe it or not, he is the only thing that is not man-made. Therefore, he is true. We should return to him and trust him because he is God. Second of all, his laws 
Um, frankly, that his laws are just and good. Again, the Bible supersedes the Constitution of the United States. The Bible supersedes any law that's on books uh, in the um, Supreme Court. The bylaws of this very church, the Bible supersedes. Because the Bible was written by God. The Bible is His Word. It is just. It is good. It is perfect. And the Bible should be the greatest cornerstone of this nation. Why else should we put God first? Because God's protection is provided to a nation that is exalted. He has promised and promised and promised. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus said if we proudly claim God before men... He proudly claims us before God. But if we deny him before men, then he too will deny us before God. We have the promise from the Heavenly Father. We have the promise from Jesus Christ to protect, to provide, to be there for us. Folks, let me tell you something. As great as our nation is, and I don't say this in any kind of terrible, mean way, but your government will not always be there for you. Your president will not always be there for you. Your governor will not always be there for you. Your sheriff will not always be there for you. Your mayor, your council, your board will not always be there for you. But Jesus Christ will always be there for you. And the word of God will always be there for you. And it will never leave you. You might turn your back on it or turn your back on him, but they will never leave you. And then the last thing that we need, why do we need to put God first? Because our worship of God and the faith that we have in him will influence others. We will influence more virtue, more purity, more truth, and even more intelligence in our nation if we put Christ first. Now doesn't that sound like a good place to live? Doesn't that sound like a nice neighborhood to be a part of? Doesn't that sound rich and inviting and, and, and like a place that you can be content and a place that you can be happy? It's right there in your grasp, and it's called Jesus Christ. If we as a nation will just return to him, if we as a nation, if we as Christians will lead that charge, will lead that way, God has promised something right there at the end of verse 14 of what Brendan read. He said, I will hear. He will hear our prayers, and he will move mightily in our midst. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father God, we come to you, and Lord, we look to Jesus right now to be the author and perfecter of our faith. We look right now for Jesus to be the cornerstone of our nation. We look right now for Jesus Christ to be the one to save our nation, to save our land, to heal our nation, to heal our land. We look right now to the Lord Jesus Christ to be first and foremost above all things. Father, this morning we want to pray for revival. We want to pray, Father, that this morning our president, President Trump, will be revived. That you will fill him with godly wisdom and godly conviction. We want to pray this morning, Lord, that our vice president, Mr. Pence, he will be filled with godly vision, godly wisdom, godly conviction. Father, for the members of our Senate and our House, for the members of our Supreme Court, and Lord, we work our way down through the members of the Cabinet, through the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
We work our way all the way down through our federal system. And Lord, we pray, Father, for revival to happen in each and every soul so that they may leave the charge for us to be a great nation again. Father, not to sound political in any way, but Father, I truly loved Mr. Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again. And Father, that's what you say that can only be done through Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for Governor Edwards. Lord, we know that he and, and all the other governors and the leaders of our land have been... Uh, challenge over these last few months we pray for him and, Lute and lieutenant governor Lynn Gesser father we work our way all the way down to our local officials father we pray that these men and these women first and foremost will come to know Jesus Christ if they don't father and if they do that they will be revived and pulled closer to the Lord Jesus Every song that we sang this morning, Father, every patriotic song, at some point in time, the truth is in there that you receive the glory, that you are the founding father of this great land. And we need you to be father once again over all of our hearts. And Father, we pray, Lord, that eyes will be opened Ears will be open, hearts will be open, minds will be open, and lives will be changed by the Word of God, by the Son of God, by the Holy Spirit of God, by you, Father, in whichever way you see fit to present yourself for change. Every head is still bowed. Every eye is still closed. And I want you to pray. I want you to take the next 30 seconds. It'll be a time of silent prayer. And I want you to, first of all, pray about your condition with God. And then I want you to pray about our nation's condition with God. And I want to invite you to join me in wholehearted prayer for our nation. 30 seconds beginning now. 